Hello everyone. This is Katie Verhoeven. I am the communications coordinator with the River Institute. Um, it says we have attendees. I can't see who anyone is or any other faces, um, but I would really love it if you could um, put your name and where you are in the live event Q&A down the right hand side. I'm just going to quickly go over some helpful tips. So first off, make sure your volume is on. It's down in the right hand corner. Secondly, try to close anything that you have open. Um, number three here shows you that on the right hand side is the live event Q&A. Um, oh, other windows up top that'll slow down being able to watch this. Um, and you can either put your name in. If you don't put your name in, it will show uh, as anonymous. So hopefully everyone is all set up, ready to go. I am just going to give your TV a countdown. Your TV Coach Go Cable will be broadcasting us live to channel 11 and 700. So Gabe, I assume you're here listening in. You can go live in three, two, and one. Hello everyone and welcome to Science and Nature Untapped, formerly known as Science and Nature On Tap. Um, pre-pandemic when we would host these events from schnitzels in Cornwall, Ontario. Um, I hope that everyone who is watching online was able to log in. We will get started with our presentation tonight. We begin this event by acknowledging that many of us are living on unceded land and traditional territory of Indigenous people. We're grateful for the opportunity to live where we do, and we thank all the generations of people who have continued their responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immemorial. I'd like every to encourage everyone to please follow us, the River Institute, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of our handles are there. And upcoming River Institute events. So we will be continuing to do our events online. I think for the most part at this point, it's implied that even if we don't say online event, it is an online event until future notice. So on July 8th, August 5th, September 2nd, October 7th, are all of our upcoming dates for our next Science and Nature Untapped. And then on October 28th and 29th will be our River Symposium. We are, this was rescheduled from a spring event that was supposed to happen at the end of May. So we will keep you posted on details. We're working out the details on that. I think that is everything that I needed to cover. So up next, we will be having Matt join us. And I will switch over. Oh, Matt, your content is up. So I will just add Matt to the presentation. Matt, I'll give you the go ahead. And I just wanted to remind everyone as well that um, on the right hand side in the live event Q&A, Matt will be taking questions or if you have comments, anything like that, um, you can put them in the live event Q&A down the right hand side and we will be addressing them at the end. So Matt, if you wanted to uh, open up your presentation again, then I will add that um, and then send you live as soon as you're ready. 
We had a couple of people, um, George, an SLC student, Catherine from Kingston, and some River Institute people as well. Okay. And Matt, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, Katie. And um, hello, everyone from wherever to wherever you are. Um, I'm Matt Wendell. I'm a research scientist at the River Institute uh, in Cornwall. And uh, I'm really excited today to talk to about some of the research I've been doing in collaboration with some other uh, people at the River Institute and, and other agencies and other people working on the river to look at the biodiversity and, and the health of the Upper St. Lawrence River. And we kind of came up uh, actually Jeff Rydell, our, our uh, director, came up with this catchy title for this uh, riding an aquatic roller coaster because we wanted to relate the, the biodiversity of the river to the water level fluctuations that are, that are seasonal and that and, uh, in some cases are happening to extreme levels um, in recent years. So that's what I'll be talking about today. I start off just uh, talking about the importance of rivers and, and this picture of uh, the continental US really strikes home how much rivers uh, connect everything. Their, their waterways, their, their, um, these kind of life arteries and veins of the landscape. Um, they have disproportionately high biodiversity compared to other types of habitat relative to their area. So wildlife, and, uh, flora and fauna, plants and animals are, are, tend to be highly concentrated near rivers and streams and brooks compared to other types of habitats, uh, in particular wetlands. So this, you can see uh, um, all these rivers uh, within these different large watersheds are, are very well connected. So what happens in one area has this cumulative effect on the entire system. There's a seasonal ebb and flow of, of water supply to rivers, and we're all sort of familiar with this, right? So in the springtime, we see uh, the spring freshets when we have the melting of, of snowpack in uh, northern climates like Canada. So all that snow melts and, and, and goes into the watershed and eventually gets concentrated in these rivers and, and their water levels increase at this time of year. So this is usually March, April and May. Um, also coincident at this time, we also have uh, more precipitation happening. So um, both these things kind of combine to create uh, higher water levels um, in the spring. And then we see these decline, but um, this has been happening. This type of cycle happens um, on a seasonal basis, and it's also been happening for thousands and thousands of years. So all of the plants and animals that live in these systems have adapted to these seasons. They, they depend on them. Um, they're, they're good things for ecosystems. If we want to look at this, the seasonal pattern of the water levels, we can graph them out in what's called a hydrograph. So this is either water levels or discharge, which is the volume of water moving through a stream. Um, and we can plot that over time throughout a year. So this is actually a hydrograph for the Ottawa River, and you can see uh, this large peak happens in April, May, and June. Um, in brown there, you can see the mean water levels, and of course in 2019 we had uh, an extremely high water level year, 100-year uh, flood year, and you can see that uh, greatly exceeded the uh, historical average there. But again, wildlife and flora and fauna in these systems are developed to this seasonal pattern, so um, they tend to be able to handle these types of floods, and floods are not necessarily a bad thing in terms of the ecology of uh, rivers. So how do these, these water level fluctuations that happen on these seasonal cycles and in these decadal yearly cycles, how does that affect rivers? Well, it does that in a number of ways. Um, it enhances uh, the productivity and the suspension of organic materials and sediments. So when we have those flood events, they pick up a lot of sediment and they move them somewhere else and they deposit it along with nutrients, so it rejuvenates a lot of types of landscapes. Um, it also really, really strongly influences the timing of breeding for different species. A lot of species depend on flood, uh, flood period to actually have access to different types of habitats, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and also these types of flood events and these high water events affect the habitat availability. If you have a really deep, narrow channel, for example, uh, that's one type of habitat, but when your water levels spill over the banks of a river, and now your water is uh, in shallower water and it's, it's warmer, might be higher nutrients, you're creating lots of different types of, of habitats. And perhaps you're flooding in a forest, for example, so there might be wood cover for uh, 
for uh, fish as well to take cover. So the complexity increases when you when you have these flood events, which is a tends to be a good thing for uh, ecosystems in the long term. And of course, this also has large impacts on vegetation that live along the margins, the borders of rivers. Um, they also have adapted over thousands of years to these seasonal fluctuations. So here's an example of a river delta, and you can see just the, um, the outflow at the river delta is transporting a lot of sediments and nutrients. And this could be a tributary of the St. Lawrence River, for example, or a, a large river entering Lake Ontario. But um, this, this seasonal input of nutrients and sediments is really important. Um, rivers, when they're complex, can also retain a lot of nutrients and a lot of water. The more complex they are, the more, uh, especially with uh, wetland habitats, they can retain water. And this actually um, prevents a lot of uh, downstream runoff and can also prevent damage, for example, to infrastructure. Um, habitat and biodiversity are, of course, uh, uh, really influenced by seasonal fluctuations in water. Um, terrestrial and, and aquatic uh, uh, different types of habitats meet at these margins, so they're really important um, um, seasonally. Uh, rivers provide corridors of movement for fish. This is an uh, American eel. Uh, my favorite fish, and uh, um, they, some species like American eels and sturgeon uh, really depend on access to movement through rivers. So this is really important, and when it's impeded by barriers, it can really significantly affect their populations and long-term health. So complexity for rivers is good, um, and this this is kind of a, something you need to, to convince people of. Um, we, we like building structures and infrastructure near rivers. We like the view. Uh, we, we tend to build our cities next to water for the water supply, rivers. Um, and we like to be able to control the behavior of rivers. So uh, we put water control structures in place, dams for hydroelectric power. Uh, we fortify shorelines. Um, ideally, I think a lot of humans would like a, a, just a very straight river just to be able to control it. But in terms of e uh, the ecology of rivers, this is really, really bad. Messy, messy rivers are good rivers. And you can see this kind of strongly meandering river in, in the picture here. Um, so when we have this complex type of river structure, uh, it increases the different types of habitats we have, which is great. More types of species can, can live in that type of environment then. It increase, increases the connectivity between river networks, which is great. Um, water flood, flood events, for example, um, you have retention of water, sediments, nutrients, things like that. And what's really important is that when we have complexity of rivers, we have resistance to disturbances. And this is something that uh, is going to become more and more frequent, frequent with climate change. Um, the oscillations in, in the weather we've been having, we, we all see it and, and the long-term predictions are that this will continue. So complex rivers can resist um, large disturbances to the system. And they also can return to their pre-disturbance um, scenarios more easily to than say a less complex river, for example, a canal or drainage stream. So this is messy rivers are good. I hope everyone uh, takes home that message after this presentation. There's lots of stressors for rivers. Uh, this is worldwide. This is happening again because we tend to like to build our cities and towns um, and our populations settle next to rivers because of the, uh, the water availability. So um, Really dramatic things are happening across the world, and um, some large scale studies are taking place to document these. But ecosystem fragmentation is a big one. This is when we put barriers in place and we section up different parts of the river. Um, we also can, we've altered the flow of rivers as well with uh, different structures. So they don't have that se natural seasonal fluctuations that they, uh, um, the wildlife, the flora and fauna have adapted to for thousands of years. So this is having consequences now. So we're having uh, reductions in complexity, um, in some cases, less water. Um, this is happening out uh, in the, the west coast of North America, particularly. If you look at the Colorado River, it, it barely reaches the ocean anymore because they take uh, up to 70% of the water supply out of the river before it reaches the ocean, which is incredible. And of course, pollution, we, we uh, are over harvesting. It's kind of a doom and gloom list. Um, not all rivers are affected by these. Um, significantly, but uh, they, these all tend to be things that are happening right now in rivers worldwide. And of course, climate change is affecting everything. This is a great map. So this is a study that was done last year, and it maps the, the world's free flowing rivers. 
the rivers that don't have structures in place that are uh, creating some sort of barrier. Um, color code wise, just red is bad and blue is good. And, and essentially you see that uh, free flowing rivers are, are really confined now to the Amazon basin in South, um, South America, um, the Congo basin in Africa and the Arctic. Everywhere else, uh, rivers have been significantly impacted in terms of their connectivity. This is having impacts on water level fluctuations as well. This has impacts on, on um, when we talk about altering river fluctuations of water, uh, this has impacts on biodiversity. So what is biodiversity and, and how do we measure it? This is a nice picture of uh, some fish that were collected along the St. Lawrence River in the Thousand Islands area. And you can see a nice diversity of fish um, from a wetland, typical uh, wetland assemblage there. So one term that you, you probably hear often is species richness. This is just the number of species at a given location at a given time. This, this uh, graphic here is showing two different sites as an example. So site one obviously has more species you can see than site two. So we would say that species richness is, is greater in site one. So this is kind of the, the most basic type of measurements of uh, biodiversity. But we also need to uh, take into account the abundance of each species within each, uh, individuals within each species. So in site one, you can see that um, the number of individuals per species is pretty even, right? We have three species and they're all around the same uh, level of abundance. At site two, most we still have three species, but most of the individuals are in one species. So we have this sort of imbalance towards one species. So there's different diversity um, indices we can use to take into account the richness, the number of species, and also how individuals are spread out among those species. Um, so that's really important to do. Um, you can see that site two probably is less resilient than site one in terms of impacts. If something happens to the most abundant fish, we don't have a lot of other individuals left. When we talk about diversity, we also uh, need to consider scale. So. Uh, we can look at the scale of diversity in terms of a watershed. That's uh, when rain falls, it runs off, and essentially the area where it all concentrates is, is considered to be a watershed. We can look at diversity of, of river stretches, and we also can look at uh, local habitats, for example, on the scale of meters. Um, so that's what we tend to do with our, our work in the St. Lawrence River, is we, we look at these different levels of, of diversity. Um, so yeah, we, we talk about the St. Lawrence River. The St. Lawrence River is, is one of the great rivers of the world um, from its outlet at, on Lake Ontario all the way to the estuary in Quebec. It's over a thousand kilometers long. Um, this isn't necessarily one of the, the biggest rivers in terms of length or outflow, but uh, it's, it's easily one of the most important and um, super interesting rivers in the world because it's the outlet of the greatest freshwater system on the planet. Uh, where we live, we have we we won the lottery essentially when it comes to freshwater, and uh, uh, availability and access to freshwater is going to be something that is increasingly under stress uh, moving forward uh, with climate change. So we we are very lucky, and we it, it's one of the reasons where we need why we need to study the system uh, very closely. So the Saint Lawrence River is, as I mentioned, the outlet of the Great Lakes. Um, and this is about 20% of the world's freshwater supply in one, one location. This is a series of five lakes that eventually all drain out. And uh, the St. Lawrence River is the outlet of, of Lake Ontario. Um, there's about 40 million people or so around the Great Lakes. Um, so this provides drinking water for a lot of people. Um, and the St. Lawrence River has, moving, going back uh, hundreds of years, has been used for a transportation navigation. And then uh, recently in the 1900s, um, large scale hydroelectric um, infrastructure was put in place on the river. So it does, does have um, quite a bit of biodiversity within this uh, river. Uh, it's a very new river. It's only about eight to 10,000 years old. Uh, this is very new compared to say the, the Nile River in Africa or the Amazon in South, um, South America, which are millions of years old. So um, this is because the St. Lawrence River is essentially the, the remnants of uh, glacial melt that happened uh, up in the, as recently as 10,000 years ago. So our species are, are just moving in. They're, they're still moving northward from, from the southern United States where they didn't have glaciation. And a lot of the species we have actually moved up from eastern United States. We have about 80 species of, of uh, fish in the upper St. Lawrence River. 
And this is the stretch between Kingston and Montreal. So great diversity, but there's been um, major, major changes to this fish assemblage. Uh, and again, this is uh, after the European arrival, there was over harvesting of some species like this large sturgeon you see in the picture. Um, there was um, the construction of dams, which uh, really fragmented the river and cut off access. We, uh, American eels, for example, are one of the most abundant fish in the river and are now at about one or two percent of the former abundance. And we also have introductions of new species that I'll, uh, I'll be talking about as well. So what the, the species look, uh, the assemblage, all these different species living together uh, 400 years ago and then today is very different. We, we've actually extirpated uh, Atlantic salmon from the river as well, which is quite bad. In uh, the 1950s, uh, large scale hydroelectric projects were put in place. These are some of the largest construction projects in the history of North America, actually, so it's, it's quite impressive. And um, you can see in this diagram that they're labeled where these uh, structures were put in place. Uh, structure number, uh, label number four there shows the location, or three, sorry, that shows the location of the Moses Saunders Dam. And this is the, the major control of uh, water levels in, in the river to some degree, and uh, Lake Ontario. And you can see, and I'll show you this graph again here, but um, there's a hydrograph here showing water levels in Lake Ontario. And then the arrow points to when the, the dam is put in place. And you can see following that, the, the fluctuations in water levels uh, become far less uh, extreme. So we've actually controlled water levels since um, to some, we've kept them in a certain margin um, since the 1960, essentially. Here's a, a, a side profile of the Great Lakes system um, depth wise. You can see the different uh, Great Lakes there. The, the big drop at Niagara Falls there. And then the highlighted here, area here is where the Moses Saunders Dam was put in place. And this is at the Long Sioux Rapids. So this is a, a narrow section of the river, very fast flowing uh, right up to 19, 1950s. Uh, very cold, fast moving. A lot of fish that use this type of habitat would have, would have spawned here, for example, like sturgeon, um, suckers. There was uh, lots of walleye in this area as well. And when the dam was put in place, we had huge changes to the river after this. The river, the St. Lawrence River can be thought of in, in terms of four distinct sections. So starting from uh, the outlet at uh, Lake Ontario, you can see here the Thousand Islands area. Um, it's called Thousand Islands. There's actually almost 2,000 islands, more than that, uh, depending on how you, you define the area. But uh, lots of islands, lots of shoals. Um, this area has not changed as much relative to um, downstream sections of the river. It still, it still looks a lot like it did, essentially. Um, prior to 1960. The next section is the middle corridor. So this is very straight section that there's almost no islands. Um, it's, it, there's not a lot of shallow water either. It's very channelized and um, it, there's a bit of a drop uh, as well. The next section is right immediately upstream of the Moses Saunders Dam in Cornwall. And this is uh, what's called Lake St. Lawrence. So this is a, a reservoir that was created by the construction of the Moses Saunders Dam. And when this happened, and I'll show a figure of this, it, it dramatically increased the surface area. And you can imagine that when you put a barrier in place on a river, you're going to back up water behind that barrier. So that's, uh, for example, the Hooper Dam and Lake Mead. This is our equivalent here, Lake St. Lawrence behind the uh, uh, Moses Saunders Dam. So this, this uh, section of the river is very unique, Lake St. Lawrence, compared to the other sections because it experiences very extreme uh, water level fluctuations because it's the, the reservoir, the head pond for the hydroelectric dam. So as, as water supply uh, is increased or decreased through the, the dam, uh, this section experiences fluctuations to a much larger degree than other sections. And then immediately downstream of the Moses Saunders Dam, we have Lake St. Francis. This is from Cornwall um, all the way to um, essentially to Montreal, the Bohan. Bohanois Dam. So this, this uh, water levels in this section are uh, very different than Lake St. Lawrence. This section in Lake St. Francis is kept very level. So it's kind of a flow through system. Whatever enters the, the uh, Moses Saunders Dam, the same amount exits um, the Bohanois Dam at uh, Montreal. So it's very shallow and wide and very, the water levels have been kept very constant. So 
So under that context, um, we can see um, looking at Lake St. Lawrence, um, when it was created, it actually flooded some existing towns that are now called the Lost Villages. Um, and this had really big impacts to aquatic near shore habitats as well. This map shows Lake St. Lawrence and um, the flow of the St. Lawrence River. So the dark blue sec the dark blue color of the river is, is the original uh, shape of the river. And then the lighter blue shows all the uh, additional habitat that was created when the Moses Saunders Dam was created. So largely it flooded uh, uh, agricultural lands, fields that are very uh, shallow now. So we have this kind of shallow lip and edge um, throughout this whole area that again experiences these really dramatic water level fluctuations. And some of the infrastructure from this, this, uh, these flooded lost villages can still be seen. So there was an old, uh, the main highway between Toronto and Montreal was flooded and, and had to be moved and, and uh, uh, constructed again. But you can actually see if you fly over it, uh, this is with one of our drones, you can see the old highway remnants um, from an overhead view. So very cool. Again, so this is brand new habitat that was created. This is not, this is not river habitat that's thousands of years old. This is river habitat that is 60 years old. So it's, it's a big experiment, essentially, that fish have moved into these shallow areas over the past 60 years. They've um, gotten to adapt to these water level fluctuations that are happening here. Lots of different stressors on the St. Lawrence River uh, besides um, the implementation of, of water level management regimes since the 1960s. Land use has changed dramatically as well um, within the St. Lawrence River watershed. What you can take home from this is that the green represents forest. So this is this is the watershed of the Upper St. Lawrence River, and uh, one of our uh, research scientists, Marianne Perone, put this together. Um, very nice graphic. So what you see here is the green is is forest. This this mostly would have been forest 400 years ago, um, but sort of a tan colored brown cropland is all new. And you can see around Lake St. Uh, Francis. Um, it's it's quite significant. Most of the most of the forest has been cleared and has been converted to farmland. Um, this is important because all the, the, the water uh, water runoff from the landscape from tributaries entering the St. Lawrence River carries a lot of nutrients now from this farmland um, and that will impact the biodiversity of the river in these sections. Vegetation along the river follows a very uh, standard pattern. So we have this kind of cross section of, of river um, habitat. Uh, this, this applies to wetlands. So you can see here, if you take a cross section of a wetland, this is a different types of plant communities you would find because they're all adapted to different uh, water levels. So if you go out into the deeper water, you have floating, uh, floating types of vegetation. And then some of them are rooted at the bottom, but they, they just kind of come up at the uh, surface. Um, and then you have what are called emergent plants that um, their, their root systems are, are submerged underwater, but most of the plant is, is above water. And then as you move further upland, you have different types of grasses and sedges that are more tolerant of dry conditions. So if you have a nice range of all these types of vegetation, um, this, this gives you a very healthy type of wetland. And the way that you get this type of uh, this, uh, continuum, this gradient of vegetation is with water level fluctuations. If you keep water levels at one one relatively uh, narrow range, you're going to favor one type of this uh, one of these habitat communities. So here's an example of emergent and floating marsh. You can see the plants coming out of the water here. So if, you, if you're paddling on the river somewhere, you might you'll see this uh, quite often. This is very common marsh. Um, a little further up, you'll see the the cattail marshes. So most of the plant sticks above water but the root systems need to be submerged. They, they do need water. And then a little bit further up, you have uh, sedge and meadow marsh. So it's kind of like a little, it's more like grasses, uh, sedges have little, sedges have edges, they have little sharp edges on them. Um, the sedges are really important for a lot of species for um, um, reproduction and, and food sources. In particular, uh, northern pike. So northern pike spawn in the spring and they really depend on these flood events. So uh, when the spring freshet comes, the river water levels increase and water moves into those sedge areas that would normally be a little drier. And pike spawn in these sedges and their eggs stick to the, uh, the grasses and the sedges and then the, the large pike leave again. So they need access to those further upstream, uh, further upland 
types of vegetation like sedges and, and uh, grasses. So here's a hydrograph of Lake Ontario uh, going all the way back to 1860 to 2005. And you see those were kind of starting in 1860, large scale oscillations. And we have several years where there's higher, it goes higher and lower. It's almost on a, a decadal scale. So every 10 years or so, it, it dips. And then the red line um, shows the Moses Saunders Dam construction. And we see that the oscillations in water levels now uh, are much reduced. So it's kept within a much more narrow range. So if you do this for 60 years, um, there's there's pretty significant impacts. So actually, a lot of studies have been done on the vegetation communities that have been impacted by um, this narrower margin of water level fluctuations. So here's a study by uh, Will Cox back in uh, 2008, and they, they used uh, aerial photography going back to the 1950s, and, and this was of wetlands, um, and they, they looked at the, how those wetlands changed from the 1950s all the way to the uh, 2000s and just compared the different vegetation communities and how they changed. And what they found was that back in the 1950s, uh, the predominant vegetation community in wetlands of the St. Lawrence River was meadow marsh. And that over time, uh, this uh, cattail community has taken over. Um, and, and unfortunately, this is a largely a, a invasive type of cattail that's a hybrid that's taken over. But you can see a figure on the right there, and you can see the uh, one, one site called Eel Bay. The meadow marsh is in black, and the, the typha, the cattails, is in gray. And you can see meadow marsh declining over time and typha increasing over time. This is happening everywhere. And if you go to the river now and you go to a wetland, you're probably going to see something like this, right? This is what you're, you're used to seeing now, is, is just predominantly cattails everywhere. And this is largely a monoculture. This is the, almost the only species you find um, in some of these wetlands. The monocultures in general are, are not a good thing in terms of diversity. Um, cattails in particular are, are not great because they actually block access to those uh, upland sedge, uh, meadow marshes and, and sedges for spawning fish like uh, pike. So pike actually can't get access anymore because they'd have to go through this extremely thick vegetation community of cattails. We've actually seen uh, over time species like pike that depend on, on these flood events to access marshes and um, have declined dramatically. And this is, is largely driven by uh, poor spawning um, on a yearly basis. There's just, there's just uh, um, fewer and fewer spawners that are successful. So this is 30 year uh, graph essentially showing catch per uh, and index scale net um, over 30 years. And the take home message essentially is that the Catches are going down dramatically, significantly. And we see this in all sections of the Upper St. Lawrence River. So the International Joint uh, Commission is in charge of managing uh, international uh, waterways. And um, they essentially did a 14-year scientific study on the impacts of, of the uh, water level control regime that was put in place in 1958. And they concluded that it, it is actually harming the river's ecosystems. So they, they put a plan in place, um, I'm sure some people have heard about it, uh, Plan 2014, that uh, was going to return a, a more natural water level fluctuations through the river to help rejuvenate these ecosystems. So the, the hope would be that these cattail dominated wetlands would now shift back towards meadow marshes and then help a lot of um, increased biodiversity of vegetation communities, which then would help uh, different types of birds and fish that depend on that biodiversity. Unfortunately, uh, the last since that was put in place in 2017, uh, two of those four years have had 100-year flood level events. They, it's just a, it's, a, it's a crazy coincidence, essentially. But um, and there's been independent reviews of this, looking at whether Plan 2014 caused these flood level events, and um, all the independent reviews have said that it's actually due just to, to massive influxes of, of water into the system. And I'll show you a graph that essentially shows that. But So we had um, really high precipitation in the spring of 2017, and then lots of snowpack melt in 2019. Um, so this, these are hydrographs, again, just water level fluctuations of the different Great Lakes. So uh, Lake Superior, uh, Michigan, and Huron are combined into one because they're essentially the same level, uh, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And you can see that, um, you look at uh, 
the, the far right part of these hydrographs from 2014 to 2020, there's an upward trend, trend in water levels in all the Great Lakes, uh, including Lake Ontario. And you can actually see I've highlighted some of those um, peak years there in this graph. So again, we see in Lake Ontario, there's reduced fluctuation compared to those other Great Lakes that you see larger uh, highs and lows essentially over time. But they're all experiencing more water recently. And this is just part of this natural cycle. It, it'll likely go down again. We can't, it's harder and harder to predict these things with climate change, but uh, if you follow the pattern, um, it'll likely go down again and up again into this type of oscillation. So we, we've impacted water levels uh, by these control structures. Other things are happening in the river too that are impacting biodiversity. Um, and, and one of the big ones is that when we created the seaway, we uh, a lot of ships were coming in with ballast water and, and releasing that ballast water from Europe and from other countries into the Great Lakes. And we've had uh, almost 200 species of, of invasive species released into the, the river, um, many of which were, were from this ballast water source. And one of the main ones was um, um, zebra and quagga mussels. And those came in the late 1980s and have just dominated down the, the river landscape. Uh, it's really important. We used to have uh, quite a diverse assemblage of freshwater mussels in the river. And, and this is now one of the most endangered group of animals in, in uh, North America, in particular Ontario and Canada, because of um, zebra mussels and quagga mussels. And you can see why this this one native uh, muscle on your right there is just covered in these zebra mussels, which attach to any type of surface. So uh, mussels are really, really important because they filter uh, the water, they take nutrients out, they redistribute it to the bottom of the river. And um, they also, they're very long lived and they're also a source of food for a lot of fish. They have this uh, really, really cool symbiotic relationship where they depend on fish. They attract fish with uh, different structures that come close and then they release their larvae into the fish's gills. And then the fish move their larvae around the river and then the larvae fall off the fish and they're in a new spot. So these types of uh, uh, symbiotic relationships have evolved over thousands of years. But when you have an imbalance of, of taking away a fish species or putting structures in place or introducing these things, then you have uh, really dramatic impacts to, to native mussel species. And one of the other major changes has happened it is the introduction of um, particularly of uh, the round goby. So this fish uh, was introduced again in the late 1980s in the Great Lakes area. Uh, started showing up in the in St. Lawrence River in our area about 20 years ago and uh, it is now essentially uh, one of the most abundant fish in the river. Everywhere we go uh, we find them and this had dramatic impacts on the food web a native fish that used to use the same type of habitat. And um, so biodiversity has been significantly impacted by the single, single species. So it's really important to monitor. We have uh, water level changes happening, um, more extreme ones, it seems. Uh, in recent years, because of climate change, we have infections of, of certain invasive species. There's more on the way um, in terms of fish species in particular, but also plants. So this is all a very dynamic system that for thousands of years was, was um, I, I wouldn't say completely steady, but uh, uh, there's been huge dramatic changes in the last 100 years to the system, and even with the last 60 years. And so it's really important that we, we do conduct science and monitoring on the state of this ecosystem so that we can track these changes over time. So that brings me to the, uh, the FINS project at the, uh, the River Institute. This is a project that uh, I lead at the Institute, and FINS stands for Fish Identification Nearshore Survey. And it's about collecting uh, information on the ecosystem health of the river. So we look at lots of different aspects of, of river ecosystem health, and I'll go through some of those. Um, you can see we, we take uh, water. Um, oh, I'll, I'll mention this first, sorry. Uh, so the, the FINS project is a uh, partnership between the River Institute and the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. This project was conceived jointly by these, these two organizations. Uh, we, we contribute staff, we, we sample the river together, uh, we come up with plans on, on different uh, types of projects and uh, this really um, and then we disseminate this knowledge to the community so it's been a, a really great uh, partnership um, we look at different types of, of habitats in the river we have wetlands islands lots of beaches modified shorelines and the types of information that we're collecting include water quality so 
temperature matters a lot, as well as um, the amount of oxygen in the water. That really has a big impact on what species are there, as well as the water clarity. Some species are very, very sensitive to only having clear water. So we also look at nutrients as well. Um, we look at the types of bottom substrates that are there, so that the rocks, if they're large or sandy or, or uh, silty, all the different types of vegetation that exist in the river. A lot of species are adapted specifically to live and pair with certain types of vegetation. But if you find vegetation, you can almost predict what species you find at that location, which is great. Shorelines have been heavily modified in the St. Lawrence River. I showed you that land use map earlier, where we had lots of land use changes, particularly around Lake St. Francis with uh, agricultural development. But um, it's prime real estate, so lots of people have built houses along the river. Some people are great about having more natural shorelines, and uh, but a lot of people have fortified hardened shorelines. And in some cases, I understand that if you want to prevent erosion, but uh, it does have impacts in terms of runoff of nutrients and uh, a habitat complexity of the river. We look at a lot of different uh, fish indices. So we, we go out in the river and we collect fish using seining, uh, which is a large uh, panel type net. And we scoop up fish in the near shore environment. So only about uh, depths of three to five feet or so. Um, so the, this is most fish actually in the river have some aspect of their life cycle that exists in the near shore. So this is actually one of the best margins to sample of the river to capture the full assemblage of fish in the river. And we started this project in 2015 and it's, it's, it's still ongoing, which is great. It started quite small, but uh, it, it's, it's really grown in terms of our scope of geographic scope of where we're going, uh, how many people are involved or collaborations and um, our objectives. So this map shows all those green dots are our sampling locations in the Upper St. Lawrence River from Kingston all the way downstream to, to Montreal. And uh, over the last five years, we've collected over 100,000 fish uh, from the survey. This is a very, very significant large sample size. That, um, you know, <laughs> science, we always want a large sample size because smaller sample sizes, it's harder to extract um, conclusions from. 62 species, um, including uh, five species at risk. And we've also taken a lot of measurements of their fish in terms of their length. So you can see those types of seasonal changes. So the, the project has been a really great success. And uh, I, I'm happy to talk about that uh, with anybody later as well. This map just shows all of our sampling sites broken out uh, in terms of years. So you can see it started quite small in 2015. And we really expanded over the years in 2019 um, in terms of our geographic scope. In 2019, uh, sorry, in 2018, there was some concern uh, with really low water levels in Lake St. Lawrence. This is immediately upstream of the Moses Saunders Dam. Um, concern by local people about whether those really low water levels were impacting fish communities. And we didn't really have an answer. We had some sites that we'd sampled in Lake St. Lawrence, particularly in some of these bays that are, you can see in this image here, um, can be uh, exposed to really significant drawdowns and, and essentially turn into muddy flats. We didn't have a lot of sampling sites in these areas, so we decided the following year in 2019 to do an intense study of one of these um, bays that are experienced these water level fluctuations uh, called Hoople Bay. So we visited two sites in this bay uh, from May to October last year, um, almost on a, a two week cycle, going back every two weeks. And we picked two different uh, habitat types in this bay. Um, the Murray Drain site is very natural. It has that type of meadow marsh, sedge, riparian zone vegetation that I was talking about before, which is really good for pike and other species, more natural. And then a more disturbed site next to Highway 2 uh, that is mainly dominated by cattails, so much less complex. And um, But they're both in the same day, so we're interested to see what we have, what we would find. This map just shows the St. Lawrence River, and then I've uh, highlighted Hoople Bay here. You can see some of those dots are, are uh, sampling sites within the bay. And here's just a closer view. So you can see the Murray Drain site and the Hoople Bay Causeway sites. So we, we sampled uh, over the course of the spring to summer to fall uh, 7,000 fish in, in this bay. It's a pretty good sample size. And we were actually really surprised. So this bay um, is considered to be fairly poor habitat. Again, it's only about 60 years old in terms of aquatic habitat. Um, the wetlands that are there are, are very new. They don't have very good uh, soil. And when you see the water levels draw down, it's essentially large mudflats. So we were uh, 
quite surprised actually to find 20 species of fish that live in this, uh, this bay and very similar species of fish that live in other types of wetlands uh, throughout the St. Lawrence River. Um, we did find round gobies, unfortunately, but they weren't as in high abundance as we see in other locations. Um, what we did find is that the Murray drain site that I mentioned that has those, those meadow marsh conditions is really significant spawning area for different species. So northern pike and brown bullheads and uh, different types of sunfish. You can see some pictures here. On some of our, our visits, we catch lots and lots of these little baby pike on the top image there. And the bottom one shows you um, brown bullheads. So lots of those as well. So that's great. It shows that these, you know, even though they're considered to be fairly poor habitats, they're still generating new generations of fish and they're, they're um, important spawning areas. And again, we saw the diversity and abundance of fish that we found in this, in this Hoople Bay site, which is considered to be poor, was fairly comparable to other sections of the river. Uh, here's just uh, some different fish, and I don't know if there's any uh, fishy people out there, but um, those of us uh, that study them, this probably would look very familiar to you if you were going fishing in a wetland. So yellow perch, for example, and different types of sunfish, catfish, and different uh, specific types of minnows you'd find in, in a wetland. We caught all the expected fish species in Hoople Bay, which is great. Most of which of uh, the 20 were dominated by these 12 species. We also took nutrients. So every visit we measured the amount of, of uh, nitrates and uh, phosphorus. And these are limiting nutrients in freshwater systems. So the more you have of it, you tend to have them. They tend to foster algal blooms, for example, which could be bad things in terms of taking away oxygen from, from the river uh, habitat. So it's really important to, to measure nutrients. And uh, we did see this kind of pattern where it uh, peaked in July and then went back down again. Um, we also use drones. So I, I don't know if you saw, I have, uh, I'm holding a drone in one of the promotional images for this talk, but uh, we've been using drones quite often now to, to map out our, our study areas. So we fly over them, we collect uh, hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and then we can actually, from those pictures, build 3D models of our habitats. So this is the Murray Drain site in 3D. And what's cool is you can actually put this type of model in a geographic information software, and you can actually simulate different water levels, and you can also revisit the site and look at exactly what types of vegetation were there originally. So it's really it's a really neat tool that we're using more and more now. And we have additional payloads on our drone now that we can look at um, different color themes of vegetation. So we can actually look at different types of vegetation communities just based on um, how they refract light. And we can also look at the thermal patterns of the habitat. So if there's different uh, um, warm areas or cool areas, for example, we might expect to find different types of fish. And I'll just throw a few uh, extra slides uh, here. Um, but uh, essentially, we, we found that abundance over time, this is um, our abundance of fish at our two Google Bay sites. It's not uh, super clear here, but um, it's, we, we peaked essentially in August. There was a lot more fish in August, and then it declined significantly going into the fall. So if you were going to decide, this is really important, if you're going to decide when you would want to go sample fish, um, you would probably target August as you're sampling. And again, I mentioned we found lots of different uh, types of um, fish that we're using this area for spawning. This uh, is showing some juvenile uh, northern pike that we found. And we actually, as we progressively revisited the site, we could measure um, how they progressed in length longer and longer. So that's uh, really useful as well. Uh, one of the neat things too, the, uh, one of the analyses that came out of this was that um, even though Lake St. Lawrence is considered to be uh, very heavily impacted modified habitat. It's again a reservoir at this point. You would expect maybe that some of the fish indices wouldn't compare to other sections of the river that aren't as heavily impacted, but in fact we don't see any significant differences. So fish seem to be coping okay in Lake St. Lawrence compared to the Thousand Islands and the Middle Corridor and Lake St. Francis in terms of uh, abundance and also in terms of species richness, so the, the number of species um, at, each, at each section of the river. So we see fairly comparable assemblages throughout the river, which is a, sometimes in science you want to see very dramatic differences. Um, and this is also an important finding too. That, um, the the, uh, diff the river sections seem to be behaving similarly still. So I could go on and on, but I'm supposed to limit myself to this. Um, but, so thank you very much. I just want to say thank you to uh, Marianne Perron, who did a lot of uh, analysis for this 
presentation and on the FINS data sets and to uh, Kate Schwartz for helping out uh, with some of the uh, slides and to all the different people that have helped with this project, all the, the crews. Um, uh, this is not a one person project. This is uh, dozens and dozens, dozens of people and the collaborations we've had in the, with the, the um, different organizations working on the river. So thank you to everybody. And um, I look forward to your taking your questions. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're going to do that. Uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Earlier, when we were preparing our presentation, um, Matt and Natasha and I were joking about how, how awkward it is when you finish a presentation <laughs> and no one claps. So um, there we have it, Matt. Huge audience for you. Big applause. And like um, we'll, we will go to questions. Ready for questions? Shoot. OK, I'm going to put your face back up on screen for everyone. Question from Kat Cavanaugh. Invasive Hi, species like the goby and zebra mussels are horrible and thinking about them is depressing. What keeps you going and gives you hope in your work? That's a really good question. And uh, it, it relates to this, this phenomenon that happens where funding always comes available to study species at risk. So, so species that are, are so far gone that they're critically endangered on sometimes or to study invasive species that are taking over things. You, you never get funding to study nice, healthy things that make you feel good about studying them. So that's a great question. Um, I would say that, that uh, you know, when we're out in the river, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's not as severely impacted as a lot of other rivers in the world. And that's something to keep in mind. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's some rivers in, in Indonesia and in, I, I, I was in China last year and uh, the Yangtze River has different sections that don't have any fish left. They're considered to be um, zero fish abundance now, just because of the impacts from overfishing and uh, constructions of hydroelectric projects. So, so knowing that and then going to the St. Lawrence River, it's, it's, you take that into account. There are changes that are happening, but the river is still, uh, most of the fish that used to be there are still there. Uh, we're just seeing these, these new, new fish come in and this kind of rebalancing happening. And you know our different generations will be tracking us over tens and maybe even hundred years. Hopefully, there won't be any more invasive species like the round goby that are introduced. Um, but um, it's it's it is kind of exciting to to track these things as well and, and see how different fish are reacting to it. There's there's a lot of fish that are have decided that round gobies are a great food source. So bass and walleye seem to be feeding on them and and uh, reaching very large sizes now. So. It took a few years actually for those species to kind of swing around and adapt to that. But um, there's there's kind of this oscillation and rebalancing that's constantly happening. So also just uh, it's really nice to be out on the river and it's sunny out and it's hard not to be happy sometimes when you're in those conditions. <laughs> I think you know all about that cat. I know you, you're out in the river a lot too, measuring uh, water quality. So OK, question from Craig. The areas most prone to extreme water level fluctuations, um, i.e. being left high and dry as per this past January, are areas flooded by the Seaway project. What do we really know about the habitat slash spawning quality of these areas as opposed to the original riverbed areas? And uh, just so that you know, we have uh, five other questions and, you know, seven eight nine ten ish minutes left okay so really quick that's a that's a really really good question actually so these are new habitats that are created by the flood the uh, flooding of the seaway and uh they're considered to be poor quality as i mentioned in terms of soil um these are probably smaller prior to the construction of the seaway these would have been shallow margin habitats that were still used by these species and we just gave them a whole bunch more of that type of habitat uh, but it's not great habitat because of that that water level fluctuation so um, if water levels are high in the spring and that's when they spawn um, and the conditions are right in terms of the vegetation or the, the soil types they need, um, they'll probably be OK. If water levels uh, decrease, as you mentioned, in January, most fish aren't spawning then. Um, 
So they're, they're not as impacted by the timing of that, that drop in water levels, um, but they would be much more significantly impacted by drawdowns during the spawning season because the small fish can't move. They're usually, you know, eggs and, and smaller um, young of the year fish are, are trapped usually. So um, if we're going to keep water levels high during these, these flooded areas, then we really want to make sure it's usually the spring and early summer for most species. I hope that answers your question. Next question is from Cornwall City Councillor Todd Bennett. The residents of Long Sioux would disagree with Plan 2014 as they have almost zero water around some of their waterfront homes by midsummer. Would it be fair to say that Plan 2014 is almost too cautious with water levels when you consider that waterfront homes can no longer dock their boats at their own personal docks? Hmm, that, that's um, it's more of a regulation type question, but uh, I would say that we do need to think about how the timing of water levels in terms of if we're just going to focus on the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem in, in the Long Sioux area, like St. Lawrence area, um, the timing of those water level drops really matters for, for the biota of the river. So it, it, I understand that the IJC is trying to move more water out of the system because of these um, high water level years we've been having. And of course that results in, in drawdowns in um, immediately upstream of the Moses Saunders Dam. So it, it's just one of those things where um, it, it's really unfortunate. I, I feel bad for people that do have docks that are high and dry. Um, so I, I don't have a clear answer on that except that I, I just going back to the thing about how the timing of those water level fluctuations in terms of ecosystem really matters. OK. Um, Catherine, question from Catherine. Do your Hubo Bay nutrient concentrations co-vary with water level fluctuations? Uh, that's a great question too. Uh, I haven't looked at that. We do have the water level data um, for that area. We, um, they seem to correlate pretty well with, with the overall seasonal pattern of nutrients in other parts of the river in terms of you know, peaks in, in mid to late uh, summer in terms of some of those nutrients. Sometimes see a spike actually. Um, I'm not sure. I think Matt, Matt, can you hear me now? Yes. Are you in business? Okay, good. All right. We'll send you live again. Okay, he's back. <laughs> the struggle is real. You were mid-sentence, weren't you? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I don't see myself on the screen anymore, but maybe I'm not supposed to. I don't know. Okay, and at my end it says that you're still up there. So, um, okay. next question. What upcoming projects are you and or the River Institute most excited about for this field season? And that's a great question because it might look a little bit different this year than other years. That's, that's a thank you for someone for asking that. So um, I didn't get a chance to get to that presentation, but this year we're really excited because we're adding a new component on to the, uh, the survey where we'll be taking water samples and looking at the environmental DNA that's, that's found in those water samples. So all, all species that live in the water give off cells and DNA as they kind of lose cells off their body. And if you're able to um, scoop up a water sample and some of those cells are present in the water, you can actually amplify the DNA in the lab and then um, basically barcode the DNA to the species that it corresponds to. It's a new technique and it has a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of a big learning curve with it as well. So what we were trying to do with this summer is go do our regular survey, catch the fish, take a water sample, look at the eDNA at the same site and see how well it matches with the fish that we actually caught there. Because if this works well, then this is actually a really neat tool where you can just grab a sample of water potentially at some of these sites and then it'll, it'll tell you potentially more about the, uh, the biota that was there than you could have caught with the uh, traditional sampling me method. So we're, we're doing the environmental DNA or eDNA. We're also using um, some new types of uh, camera payloads on our drone 
that I mentioned that can do thermal and uh, multispectral. So looking at different uh, color wavelengths of uh, light that can tell you about vegetation communities. And we're excited to work with some new partners as well, including uh, Queen's University and University of Toronto, uh, in an upcoming project where we'll be sampling uh, using drones to actually see if we can use drones to collect those water samples on water bodies, which is really neat. Cool. We are approaching eight o'clock, but I think that since this is an online format, um, I'll just finish off. There was two two other questions and one comment, and um, you know, those who are enjoying this conversation, stay with us, and those who have stuff to do at eight. Uh, feel free to head out. Um, Nick Cox was asking, uh, and Matt, I think you'll be very excited to answer this question. What has been the impact of the disappearance of the eel since 1970s? It used to be a good scavenger. That's, it certainly was, yeah. Um, that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of smart people thinking about that right now. This was one of the most abundant fish in the nearshore environments for thousands of years. And now there's there's less than one percent of it, so that's a major shift in in biomass and also, um, you know, the fish community that used to be there. I think uh, myself and, and others like to think about how my, how many gobies that eels would be eating if they were actually present. So if you had millions of eels in the river still, and you had this little invasive goby that's not very smart and sits on the bottom, and is nice bite size for eels, um, whether or not they would have actually affected the goby population? I, I think so. Um, but go eels are long-lived species. They can live, um, in some cases, over 40 years. So they, they have overlapping generations and they, they offer that stability to the environment that um, maybe is missing now. So that's another thing that we might see more oscillations in, in uh, fish communities without these long-lived species that bring balance to that. But it's, it's not a question I think about a lot. So I'm glad you asked it. Matt, you'll be happy to know that um, we're going past eight o'clock, but the attendees didn't drop off at all. So you're very, very interesting. <laughs> uh, one more question from Kat Cavanaugh. Uh, what can we do about invasive species like cattails? Yeah, this, uh, this, that's um, cattails of, of really, they're really filling in some of the embayments of, if you go to the Thousand Islands, you see, uh, just go along the Thousand Islands Parkway, for example, on the Canadian side, you see some of those embayments are just as far as you can see cattails. So the hope is that with uh, water level, water levels returning to more natural fluctuations that that um, we'll see a shift back to um, more diverse vegetation communities along the river. That might take a long time. Uh, we're talking very long time um, at the rate it's going right now, but it might happen. So we've actually been out too, and we've taken drone surveys looking down at those wetlands of the Thousand Islands and all along the St. Lawrence River. It's just a baseline. So now we have really high resolution imagery of those wetlands. In 10 years, another person can go and do the same survey and maybe they'll see some changes. But I think, you know, short of, short of people pulling them out by the roots, which is really hard, or burning them off, which is another strategy that happens uh, in some areas. Um, hopefully this just return to natural variations in water levels will, will bring some balance back. Are you okay to take one more question? Sure. <laughs> um, Fred Schuler from Bishop's Mills Fred? would like to know, are you seeing increases in water snakes since the gobies came in? Lake Erie water snakes have gotten larger since, since gobies came in. We, we don't see, that's a great question. We don't see uh, water snakes in our section of the river almost ever. And I know we went up uh, sampling in the Ottawa River and uh, one of our staff, Kate, uh, found one immediately. But um, we would, so I know if they were in the St. Lawrence River we're sampling, Kate would find them. But they're, uh, they're, they're just, we don't see them ever. So there's some sort of uh, gap in their distribution in the upper St. Lawrence River. Um, but I have heard that, yeah, their, their population is doing pretty well with feeding on the gobies. All right. Um, Fred had a follow up. Uh, how do the typha relate to alien Phragmites moving in? We do see patchiness. Uh, the Phragmites tends to be a little more 
you know, uh, up, upland than the, the, the cattail, the typha. So you do see them uh, spreading as well, um, especially in Hoople Bay. There's some little patches of Phragmites um, that, that's actually expanding over the years. And again, with uh, regular drone surveys, we're able to track that pretty, pretty high resolution. But um, it's probably another type of vegetation that's that might actually, you know, that's a great follow-up question. It might actually benefit from some of these more natural fluctuations where drier conditions might, they might move into those. So um, I don't know if we can win against all these invasive species, but uh, it's one of the basic things we can do is at least track them. But I expect that uh, Phragmites will probably spread as well. All right, that's it. That's all the questions that we had. Um, thank you, Matt, for a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to remind people our next Science and Nature Untapped is July 8th with Barbara King from Watersheds Canada. And also, if you had trouble connecting or if anyone you know had trouble connecting, please let us know. Uh, screenshots are really, really helpful. And that's it for tonight. Thank you everyone for attending and we will see you July 8th. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone.